not only do my kids not know how to use computers, but they all, because they don't know how to use computers, they don't know how to fix things on computers. Like they don't even have, they've never had to fix anything on a computer. It's like, how do you learn how to fix crap on computers? Like, because when we were kids, our parents didn't know anything. So there was no one to ask and you had to just figure it out yourself. Yeah, we just kind of broke everything and figured out how to fix it. <laughs> That's basically how we how we figured this all out. My son had a problem recently where uh, he was like, Dad, the computer only types capital letters. Um, and so I came over, and he was like in a Google document, and he's like, look, capital letters, and it's not caps lock because caps lock light are on, on or off. Either way, it just produces capital letters, right? And he was that was it. That was the extent of his debugging. Like he, had, he knew cap locks existed. And he had tried toggling it on and off, and it confirmed that in one position the light is on, in one position the light is off. But either way, tap the letters come out. But that was it. He was out of ideas, hmm. and that's not that's not good. What was so, it like a stuck shift key? So I tried another application, which is the first thing you try: is this just Google Docs or the browser, or is it everywhere? So I've been text edit. Sure enough, only capital letters in text edit, right? So I'm like, uh, like the things you learn from a lifetime of debugging are things that could potentially solve this problem, you know? So log out, right? Uh, and we go to log out uh, or you know switch users the master switch. troubleshooting step turn everything off turn everything back on uh, and the login screen I went to log into my account and when you see the little password thing you see the little arrow that tells you that things cap locks is on you mm-hmm. know yep that puts in the, right and so basically it was like the computer thought caps lock was on all the time it wasn't you could look at the keyboard and it doesn't matter if the light was on or off but the computer was totally convinced the cap locks was on or off so I unplugged the keyboard and plugged it back in and that fixed it and then my son said to me why how could unplugging the keyboard and plugging it back in fix it uh, and i was like if you've ever fixed anything on a computer that <laughs> this fixes a surprising number of things log out and back in unplug and replug reboot turn everything off wait 10 seconds unplug it from the wall wait 10 seconds all these things have reasons behind them but like even if you don't know the reasons behind them eventually you learn by fixing things that sometimes you just have to do crap like that and the only way you learn that is by actually fixing problems in the real world without understanding why they fix you just like what can i do to make this problem go away and once it works for you once it be, it's in your bag of tricks of like just you know that general idea of start the thing over again <laughs> unplug it and plug it back in disconnected and reconnected and my kids don't even have that they don't even they don't even have the basics they, they don't have any understanding of that because they never had to fix anything themselves <laughs> so I mean, like nightmares of like them leaving the house and living on their own as an adult and having a job and calling me and saying I can't get my TV show. I can't watch my TV show. It's not working. Like, because, you know, like Netflix is broken or something. I feel like this this might be kind of how, like, like whenever anything breaks about our house, usually, you know, if it's not that critical that it gets fixed, you know, like there isn't water pouring all over everything and we're not, like, installing a fire hazard outlet in the wall. But, you know, if, <laughs> but if there's, you know, like some, like, you know, we have to, like, hang something that's kind of heavy duty on the wall somewhere or... We have to like fix something that's made of wood, you know. Usually, those tasks just accumulate until my father-in-law comes to visit. He will basically just go around the first days here and just like fix everything around the house that we've been putting off forever. Um, and I feel like maybe the way that he thinks about it, or at least the way he should think about how we seem to be totally incapable of fixing these things ourselves, might be the same way that you are thinking about like. How can your son possibly not know how to troubleshoot these computer issues himself? So I'm going to show up at his house when he's an adult, and it's like, oh, thank God you're here. We haven't been able to watch TV in, in six months. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we can't figure out why. And I'm going to go up to his television, plug, unplug it from the wall, plug it back in, and go, there you go. <laughs> that very well might be how this generation plays out. <laughs> oh, my word. I feel the same way, though. Like, I can't think of a specific example other than my fire hazard plug that isn't actually a fire hazard. But uh, there there are plenty of things that either my dad, who is very electrically inclined, or Aaron's dad, who in a prior life was a carpenter, so he's like woodworking inclined. There's many things that without them, I would have to either pay someone to do something, maybe figure it out myself in the spare time I don't feel like I have, or just live with it forever. I don't feel that incapable for home repair things. Is my my uh, my parents do? My father does come and fix everything exactly like you were saying. Your father in law comes to <laughs> yep. do, Marco, but but it's not because I don't know how to fix it. It's because I don't want to fix it. I don't have time to fix it. And and he's going to do a better job too because I have he's fixed it more times than me. But I do know what to do 
only because I spent an entire lifetime watching home improvement television shows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I spent a lot of time watching those, not as much as you, but I spent a lot of time watching those shows too. So all I can do is be the annoying person of like, are you sure you want to do it that way? Like, I, <laughs> yeah. I can be like that guy, which is the worst possible role Nobody to play. Nobody likes that guy. Yeah, because no, <laughs> like I know just enough to be able to like criticize and make stupid comments about something, but not enough to actually do it right myself or to realize what, that the way they did it is actually correct not what not my amateur view of what homes on homes would think is the right thing to do <laughs> you gotta keep watching them though like i'm i'm there i still have season passes for those shows i still watch them so then you're up to date on the latest technologies <laughs> the latest mold generation technologies <laughs> criticizing and uh and making snarky comments whatever it is you said that isn't that pretty much our show in a nutshell just criticizing from afar not really knowing what we're talking about but i like to think that we at least i i think we know more about what we criticize on this show than i know about home repairs yes yes i would say that's definitely the case (laughs) because at the very least all of us do a lot of things related to the things we're talking about whereas despite me watching home improvement shows for my entire life i've never built a house not even once All right, so we should start, as always, with some follow-up. And uh, somebody, I think John, phrased this section as pouring cold water on Apple USB-C notions. And so we talked last episode about whether or not the forthcoming iPhone, we'll call it for the purposes of this conversation, the iPhone 8, whether the phone itself will have a USB-C port on it. And there was a Wall Street Journal report that seemed ambiguously to say yes. And then Ming-Chi Kuo has come out and said, well... We believe all three new iPhones launching launching in the second half of 2017 will support fast charging by the adoption of Type-C power delivery technology while still retaining the Lightning port. So probably sticking with the Lightning port, which I think I'm in support of. But having listened to most of the shows that, that are like ours that cover this sort of thing, I feel like I'm the only one, which makes me wonder if I'm just the old man of the crowd all of a sudden. I was hoping this was a reaction to the Wall Street Journal story, which was weird and ambiguous and had everyone talk about USB-C. And then uh, Ming-Chi Kuo just says, no, 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 no. Here, I know how to speak in sentences that have meaning that is clear to the reader. (laughs) Every single new iPhone coming this year will have a lightning port on the bottom. Boom, done. And so I'm hoping it is just simply a clarification. Uh, I'm hoping what it's not is like a competing rumor of you know without any particular foundation but it certainly seemed like that 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 ambiguous story was out there there was a lot of chatter and then this thing came and just shut everybody up and said it's the boring thing never mind yeah i mean at 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 some point i think ming chu quote needs to evolve into just the dalrymple just nope yep (laughs) (laughs) no but i i think you know as we said last show this we all thought this was fairly unlikely to be the case that they would ha- that they would replace the lightning port with the USB-C port. Um, I I do think it is still worth considering as a thought experiment. I do think that if they were to actually like get drunk and do this, I I would actually welcome that change. I think it would be it would be temporary pain, but long term it would be great. And Apple usually errs on that side of that kind of decision. Um, ultimately, though, I still think it's very unlikely. With, with one little exception that we keep hearing from people about the EU regulations about phones all having the same connector. And for the for the last few years, ever since the introduction of Lightning, basically the EU said all phones have to have you know what, what used to be micro USB. And I, I have not honestly been following this very closely, but what I keep hearing from people is that that regulation is getting more strict now and that Apple will no longer be able to get away with just shipping an adapter. That, that converts lightning to USB, uh, to micro USB rather, or, or in this case, I assume it's USB-C. So there's something going on there where the EU is putting pressure on Apple, and I don't know if they're going to be able to, be able to negotiate their way out of it again, uh, but there, that, there might be something there, you know, like th- that there might be a strong reason for Apple to say, okay, you know what, in addition to all of the other reasons we have to get rid of lightning and, and switch to USB-C these days, it would also probably cause less friction with the EU and any other kind of similar regulatory body around the world that might get in the way. You know, I wouldn't expect in the next three and a half to seven years uh, that the U.S. would really care that much about reducing waste in a regulation. Uh, but I, I imagine other countries, 
that that actually have functioning governments uh, probably all have similar yeah, goals. That'd be cool. Yeah, that would be awesome, right? Uh, they probably all have similar goals of like you know reducing electronic waste and standardizing on things that really matter and stuff like that. And so I think Apple's going to keep getting pressure from large markets. You know, if I mean if China did it game over right like imagine if china said okay for to sell a phone in china after after you know 2017 it has to have USB-C on the bottom but lightning would be gone the next day you know so well, like they can make two different they can make two different models one for that market they've made different models with different things inside them before but like i china could do something like that but my understanding of the eu thing is not it's not like apple can't sell it i think it's more like a guideline or agreement and i'm sure there's some kind of carrot and stick thing where if you follow along with the agreement voluntarily there's you get some boon or whatever but um i'm not convinced that it's the type of thing where like if apple doesn't do it then they can't sell a phone in europe and if it was in china where china can say guess what you have to do this no matter what like actually make a requirement i think they would make a different model if if the conversation had not been one inside apple for usb entirely because making a different model for china is and is probably fine uh I mean, and they have done that in the past for other things, but it it seems like you know there's arguments on both sides of whether they should do this or not. And so, if there's a big thing external, a big external factor that tips them one way or the other, they would probably go that way, right? And so, if there's like a major world market of buying phones that demands in a pretty strong way or absolutely requires that they that they have a standard port on the bottom instead of their proprietary port. That would probably be enough to to sway the argument one way or the other if there were no like massive downsides that we aren't thinking of. You know, like if, there, if there's some kind of major engineering challenge of doing it, but you know, on a brand new phone that they can, that they have designed separately from the iPhone seven and six, God, I hope. Uh, I, <laughs> assuming we finally get a new design, uh, then they could totally do it, and I don't see any obvious downsides because we talked about last week. Anyway. I still don't think it's likely. I still think the most likely scenario is what Ming-Chi Kuo said, where, yeah, this rumor from the Wall Street Journal that was horribly written uh, got the facts wrong, and it's actually just USB-C on the charger end. Uh, that's the that's the way more likely explanation here. But I still do think it would be better to go USB-C on both ends, or at least the phone end, and there might be better reasons for them to do that. We don't know. So uh, the hardware mind virus worked on me because I was getting all excited about USB-C <laughs> phones until I read this uh, cold water story. I'm like, oh, never mind. But really what happened uh, related to this is my Nintendo Switch did arrive, which maybe we'll talk about later. And, uh, and I got a pro controller with it. And this is the first device, besides my Apple TV, which I never plug any USB-C things into, that I had occasion to see and mess with USB-C uh connectors with because when i got my pro controller i had to plug it in to charge it and there's a little USB C connector inside the little switch dock or whatever and so I'm, I'm holding here the uh the pro controller charging cable uh and when i took this out of the box and plugged it in i my immediate thought was oh no way is apple gonna u- ever use this thing it's huge like i know it's not that much bigger than the lightning it is barely bigger than lightning but just l- seeing it in real life i'm like can you imagine Apple putting this thing on their phone? No, no way in hell. Like, obviously this is just my gut reaction. Like I'm not using my brain at that point, but my, my visceral reaction to this connector was how massive it was compared to lightning. I was like, if I was inside Apple, I would like recoil in horror at the start of the conversation of like, remind me again while we're doing lightning again, it would take, look at this, look at this, it's giant. We can't, we can't have this on our phones. It's ridiculous. What's next? VGA ports. So God, um it really isn't I know that, that much bigger i know i know but i'm just like it, it it cracked me up that that was my reaction like it is not that much bigger like i have a lighting part here right next to it and i'm holding it up next to it like it is m- bare millimeters big but the fact that it's wider and also thicker it just makes it seem so much more massive and it doesn't help that like i have one of the good old lightning connectors here that are in front of me with the very small plastic part that's barely bigger than the metal part like it looks so small and dainty <laughs> it's almost like the lightning can go inside a USB C port well, it almost can because of the the gender flip that, between the connector and, yep. and the and the wire. You know, like like and and that's and actually, that's, I suspect I don't know this for sure. I haven't looked that that deeply into it, but I suspect the design of USB C probably permits for there to be less clearance around the port opening. Like I, I bet you can shrink the device thickness closer around the port size with USB C than you could around Lightning because Lightning has to have all the pins and everything on the inside as opposed to USB C yeah, which has just like you know the flat conductors on the inside. So it, I would imagine there might be something there with USB C. Also, 
they have tons of room. They got rid of the headphone jack, and this other speaker on the bottom is fake. So they have tons of room on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, thickness wise, obviously, with the, they're not at a loss for. But anyway, it's 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 not that big of a deal, and I still I still think it would be cool for them to go USB C. But this rumor seems to say they're not, and so we're back to the default universe of Apple, where it's lightning for a while longer yet. What I do wish for, at least, since we since we're probably not going to get our our USB C on both ends cable, does anybody make the USB C equivalent of these wonderful anchor like five port USB chargers? Like all I've seen out there are chargers that have one USB C port. I have not seen any that have like five. Like I would love to standardize on just one cable type and just like it might like I I'm I'm traveling uh, soon and. I'm packing my travel bag and I have to have all these different cable types because it's like, well, I need every combination of something on one end and something else on the other end. And I'll like everything between USB A, USB C, Lightning, micro USB. Like, I have all these stupid cable types and these 50 different chargers. Come on. I mean, anyway, so I hope, I hope there's, I hope the USB C ecosystem blooms soon because when it does, uh, that will be even more reason for Apple to please, for the love of God, change the iPhone to use USB C. Speaking of VGA, you better hope USB A, uh, USB Type A connector doesn't turn out to be the VGA port. Of our, <laughs> Just you know, hang up forever. Because you remember, like, remember how long VGA <laughs> held on? We had so many other standards that, that, like, and it was just like you could not get rid of VGA. It just stayed, st- it stayed stubbornly on the side of PC laptops. It stayed stubbornly on projectors long after multiple better, smaller standards existed. And I'm really hoping that USB A hasn't like gained enough momentum that it will not be dislodged by USB C for like an extra you know, five to 10 years just because that will be sad. You know, it's certain it's, sometimes transitions are easier, like the second time through. And in this case, like the transition from dot connector to lightning was very painful. But a lot of people took that opportunity to not just go to lightning for their devices or needs, but to just go directly to wireless to airplay and Bluetooth and things like that. Um, with the with the VGA in conference room projector situation, I wonder like how many conference rooms actually just went from VGA to DVI or Lightning, and how many just switched to other solutions like AirPlaying to an Apple TV or something like that. <laughs> no, no, spoken for someone who doesn't spend a lot of time in corporate America. Yeah, uh, no, they don't no. use AirPlay. <laughs> right, well, but that, that, well, that, so AirPlay. AirPlay is not the answer, but I got to tell you, so my office is all in on the Google ecosystem, which at, at first glance for an Apple-centric show like ours might sound terrible, but truth be told, it actually works out really well. And so in most conference rooms, there's a Chromebox, and I don't know enough about Chromeboxes to know if there's something special about them. Like I've seen the physical cardboard boxes that the Chromebox comes in, and I think it says like Chromebox for meetings or something like that on it. The the, the specific, specific wordage doesn't ma- matter. But what ends up happening is there's a TV in each of these conference rooms. There's a Chromebox hooked up to the TV, and the Chromebox shows like that room's schedule for the day, and you just select the, you know, the, the current, oftentimes the currently active button, and that will jump into the Google Hangouts for that meeting. And not having used Google Hangouts prior to coming to the company, I had heard like a lot of mixed things about it, and I thought it would be kind of garbage, but it's actually pretty nice. And that what we'll do is if you are trying to present something to the meeting, you just hop on the Hangout on your laptop, and it will it will thus uh, implicitly go to the TV in the conference room, and it will also be presented to anyone that happens to be remote as well. It works out surprisingly well, and yes, there's hiccups and coughs and whatnot from time to time, but it's really solid. I, I was very surprised how much I've I've really gotten to like Hangouts in the, in this regard. When your other choice is WebEx, anything looks good. Yeah, that's true too. <laughs> Amen, brother. Uh, yeah, if, if, so if, I'll, before we get on the topic of conference rooms, like I remember going through this several years back at work uh, when we were going through a corporate, uh, I don't know, disturbance, uh, ab- upsetness about conference room <laughs> tech. Like everyone was cranky about it, especially the tech people. And we tried all those things. We had a Google Box. We tried Google Hangouts, um, and. I, you know, airplaying to Apple TVs came up because if you look at how much money all the equipment we had that we were installing in this conference room was costing, it's like an Apple TV is nothing compared to that. Uh, and this is yet another market that Apple could have done well in with either a dedicated product like a Chromecast or just by making the Apple TV better. But it was basically a non-starter, uh, partially because, you know, no airplay on, on PCs and everything. But we had a lot of Macs, and I don't think that would have stopped it, mainly because 
it was so much of a pain to get Apple TVs onto the corporate network. You could do it, but you needed a special weird utility, and it wasn't simple, and no one wanted to go through with that. So now, instead of being able to bring your Mac into the room and airplay to the projector, you plug into one of the 800 cables that's poking out of this giant Hydra. One of it, <laughs> yes, is still VGA. Um, who knows what they're going to do if and when my work ever buys the new laptops that have the USB-C connectors, because most of the time the Mac users plug into HDMI these days. Yeah, and I have to imagine, too, like HDMI, because, you know, VGA was analog, uh, and then we finally got DVI, and then HDMI, which is basically DVI with b- bonus stuff attached to it, uh, I feel like it's easier to adapt to the to, to the new digital standards these days. And HDMI is also pretty pretty well supported now. I mean, I don't think it's, I don't think it's as big like as universal as VGA was at its peak, but I think it's getting there. Uh, and and it's going to be fairly trivial for almost any new port standard to adapt to HDMI for the foreseeable future because it's just going to be in such high demand. Every new device that has video out capability will have some way to translate that to HDMI for a long time. So I think that it's mostly a moot point these days. <laughs> We are sponsored this week by Pingdom, my favorite server monitoring service. Start monitoring your websites and servers today at pingdom.com slash ATP. You get a 14-day free trial, and when you enter code ATP at checkout, you get 20% off your first invoice. Pingdom makes the web faster and more reliable for everyone by offering powerful, easy-to-use monitoring tools and services for anybody with a website. So Pingdom can monitor availability and performance of servers, databases, websites, anything with a URL from more than 70 global global test servers so you can see for instance like if there's some weird dns problem where like your site is offline for only a certain part of the world but it happens to not be where you live you might not you might not know about that otherwise but pingdom can tell you that they can tell you so much your performance uptime they can emulate visits to your site as often as every minute to check its uptime and they can check for things like regular expressions or patterns or substrings or anything else and all sorts of you know you can you can have it serve with cookies and conditions and everything it's incredibly powerful Stuff breaks on the internet all the time. And, I mean, heck, this this past week there was an interesting outage of Amazon S3, and that caused a lot of stuff to break, and Pingdom had a lot of outages to report, and of course they did. Uh, they did their job very well there because they always do their job very well. I've been using Pingdom since, I think, 2007. It's It's been a very long time. I used it for the vast majority of Tumblr, all of Instapaper, all of Overcast so far. I use it for my personal site. Uh, our friend underscore David Smith used, used to use it to monitor the Apple WBDC page for changes and have it alert him every time whenever the page changed so we'd know when tickets went on sale because you don't have to actually own the URLs that you're testing. There's all sorts of great uses for Pingdom. And of course... If you run a server or a website or any kind of web service, you need to know when your site goes down, and you need to be the first to know. You shouldn't need to wait around to the, to later read Twitter and see, like, you've had 50 responses from people on Twitter that your site's been down over the last three hours, and you didn't even know about it. With Pingdom, you'll be the first to know. You can be alerted via text message, push notification, email, and you will be the first to know. So you can go fix it before all the people on Twitter see it and start bugging you about it, before your customers see it, before you lose any business. Check it out today. Go to pingdom.com slash ATP for a 14-day free trial and get 20% off your first invoice with offer code ATP. Thanks to Pingdom for sponsoring our show. Eric Peterman writes in, part of the USB-C spec is two-way power. Devices choose what charges what based on the order of plugging them in. So a Mac <laughs> could charge the switch. So That's this a is a terrible way to, to do it. It really is. This is with regard to the rumor or 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 maybe I guess it wasn't a rumor, but but somebody had plugged a switch into one of the new MacBook Pros and they said, Oh, this is weird. The switch is charging the MacBook Pro rather than what you would expect, which is the reverse. And this is what Eric's talking about. So I had heard separately from a not reliable source that that was actually a firmware issue with the switch. But this indicates that it's all about who plugs into what when, which is kind of bananas. The fact that it wouldn't be deterministic, like that it would like imagine, yeah. imagine like in real life, you know, anybody using these devices who isn't intricately familiar with the USB C spec, you know, oh, I accidentally plugged this in backwards and depleted the device that I was trying to charge. <laughs> you plug your phone into your laptop and it drains your phone into your laptop. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you design a spec that way? So weird. <laughs> who knows? I, I, I haven't looked this up and see, but I think it's actually a reasonable way for things to work in the absence of anything else dictating. And I would imagine if you plug a phone 
into an Apple, you know, an iPhone into an Apple laptop, they have already they already have a system through some resistor values, some other crap to ensure that it never goes in the opposite direction. But if you have two devices that are basically from their perspective, what, I don't know, I'm making up terminology, but like two host devices, like the laptop and the switch, mm-hmm. that's as reasonable way as any. If they both expect to be the thing charging, but they're plugged into each other, there has to be some kind of negotiation. A plug order sounds fine, but I would hope that for the common case where it's like one really big one and one really small one, like I would hope that the phone doesn't have the power to charge anything. I mean, I suppose it does. It powers like audio peripherals, but it's not charging them, right? No, I don't know. Barely. Yeah. All right. Uh, Daniel Klein writes in USB-C versus Lightning. Isn't the middle part of USB-C a lot more breakable than the solid Lightning connector? Uh, and he continues, more important than springs. I'm not entirely sure what he's referring to there. Like but, the little um, springy bits. Uh, you know, uh, so okay. This is my concern about uh, USB-C uh, before seeing them. And even when you see it, you can kind of you know look, in, look into the, the female connector on USB-C, and you see the little circuit boardy thing with the contacts sticking out and in theory you could stick your fingernail in there and just crack that thing down and your port is dead um i, I haven't don't have enough real world experience plugging and unplugging USB-C to say how fragile that thing is and how likely it is to either get stuff jammed around it or break these are all question marks um i would imagine that it is probably sturdier than you think because it's wedged up in there and unless you actually stick something in there to get at it it's not it's not someplace where it can get bumped or hit or anything and when the connector is around it it's very secure because it's completely surrounded by the thing so i'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt or give apple the benefit of the doubt or whoever designed this connector that that it is okay and what this question made me think about and some other people who asked similar questions about the springy bits in the contacts and maybe think about my uh, uh what i was saying last show about how it is better to have the springy bits in the cable because if they fatigue and start making bad contacts you just throw out the cable and get a new cable whereas the springy bits fatigue inside your iphone what can you do there's not much you can do about it but that was in the context of the the hardware virus where the the springy bits get less springy and don't contact well with the contacts and start arcing and make a little burny spot and that burny spot doesn't connect with another one and it spreads from thing to thing seems to me that that could still happen no matter where the springy bits are because if it starts arcing because the springy bits in your cable are bad it's going to leave that little scorch mark on the the stationary part inside the female USB-C connector. You won't see it. You won't see the little stripey thing, but it'll be there, which means that even after you throw out the cable, now one of your contacts inside your USB-C connector, inside the female end, is a little bit scorchy. And so when you stick your brand spanking new cable that you bought in there, it's going to have poor contact with the scorch part. So like that, that it could still happen is what I'm saying. Now, I guess this all depends on how resilient the springy bits are. Maybe it's the design of the springy bits that's different. They certainly, you know look different if you look inside the connectors than they do inside lightning so i don't know uh, again it's very difficult to eyeball these things based on like the few people you know and your guesstimation by looking at connectors only the companies that make the products have actual numbers and they don't seem to be sharing them but i imagine if there is a large reliability difference between lightning and USB-C, we as a society will learn that together over the next few years because even though we won't have the data eventually it'll be clear is there some sort of widespread problem with this and not a widespread problem with that or is there problems with both of them you know like i imagine it'll be about a wash but we'll see jeff spivak writes uh more naked robotic macbook pros and there's a link to yanko design which has a super case for your macbook what the deuce is going on here it's just like the MacBook Pro. This isn't a MacBook Pro. This is a MacBook. But hey, you know, these these laptops that Apple makes have USB-C and or Thunderbolt 3 ports on them, but don't have any other ports that people wanted. No SD card slot, no big honking USB-A slot or whatever. Maybe you want more battery on it. And these sort of cases for your laptops that plug into the USB-C and or Thunderbolt 3 port and add a bunch of other ports, just like one of those adapters or docks that they sell that are external, and maybe also adds battery. And so here you go, a naked robotic core of your MacBook. You want it to be thicker and a little bit heavier and have an SD card slot and a USB-A thing and w- another USB-C pass-through and a mi- micro USB? I can't even tell what the hell this thing has on it. Anyway, you want a bunch more ports and you want it to look like an ugly PC laptop with a bunch of plastic crap? <laughs> Get this. <laughs> Way so to sell true. it, John. <laughs> it doesn't look good, but what I'm saying is oh. like, this is this is 100% the naked robotic core as applied to Macs. Like, we made it as small and as thin as possible. If you want something different, you can add it. Uh, like the tech is there, you know, like all the, like all those breakout docks and adapters, like the tech is there. You could put an ethernet port in this thing, right? Go ahead. Um, 
and it's kind of amazing that this you add this thing to it and it makes your laptop like seven times thicker but it really, it really does on one side have USB A and an sd card slot on the other side have another USB A, USB C, and a micro usb or whatever the hell or maybe it's just another USB C. I can't tell like suddenly your macbook one is macbook way more than one <laughs> yeah this this thing is is something else I, I i do commend the effort of things like this to make these laptops more useful, but I think they are destined to have the same problem, the same thing I always complain about with uh, with battery backpacks on phones, that all of the like casing and electronics of overhead of having to have like the separate standalone device with its own plastic on both sides and its own like metal shielding and different parts and charging components and discharging components and everything else, like the additional bulk of having to bolt this on as a, as an external thing makes the entire package end up being so bigger so much bigger and heavier than if the, if you had a laptop that just had these things in the first place built in uh that it just doesn't it just doesn't seem compelling to me yeah and so the alternative in apple's universe assuming apple doesn't actually make a machine that has the ports that you want on it like because apple does make these things with a, a very capable port on it that is capable of supporting all this like the reason these can exist is because there is a capable the apple alternative is a whole mess of adapters and wires and we look at this and we say oh, isn't it ugly is it inconvenient it makes it thicker it makes it heavier is it uglier and more inconvenient than a whole mess of adapters or a, a, an external breakout box dock i mean it really depends on the environment you're using it i wouldn't want to be i would be more happy carrying this from conference room to conference room uh, attending a series of meetings no matter how ugly it is because it's self-contained and i don't have to have like put down my laptop then dump on the table a handful of adapters or a breakout box or this big hydra of cables like that that is worse in many ways for a machine that is supposed to be portable so yes it is technically possible to plug in a bunch of wires it kind of reminds me of those old uh imac ads where they would show like the pc with a million wires poking out of the back of it <laughs> and show like the imac and how clean it was and you didn't need all this stuff it just had one power cable right that's, and then the mouse that is keyboard. like every macbook one that people use to get anything beyond like the basics done on <laughs> yeah, and, and arguably they're using the wrong computer for that. But even I, I recall seeing, like, if you ever see a picture of a real person, like, not just a marketing shop, but someone who bought a Mac Pro and uses it for work, bought a trash can and uses it for work, <laughs> has a million wires coming out of it. And it looks for all the world like those ugly PCs. I'm not saying this is the wrong solution, but it's kind of like how they always show, like, lamps in, in product shots without wires coming from them or, like, <laughs> appliances. or Like, there's never any wires. Like, wait, how does that lamp get power? They erase the, the wires because wires are ugly. They don't want you to see them. When they're showing a picture, like, you know, here is Samsung's fancy new TV, they don't show the wires coming out of it because that's ugly. You know, even when they show the back of it, they don't show the wires because they want to show you all the ports. Wires are ugly and inconvenient and make your products look worse and are generally annoying to wrangle and so as ugly as this weird little sleeve thing is i hope the signal it's sending to apple is hey apple if you made a laptop that made a different set of compromises you may be able to uh, you know i feel like it should be apple's job to make sure that no one ever wants to buy this thing and maybe they don't want to buy it just because it's ugly but say they had just an sd card slot uh, as we've discussed on the macbook pro 13 inch would that satisfy everybody? No, because it doesn't have micro, you know, USB and, and USB-A ports or whatever. But it would satisfy slightly more people, and what would the cost be? So it's it's very difficult knowing what, what the right compromise is for the complement of ports. I do like the idea that things like this are possible. I don't like the idea that people would be driven to buy them because they're, you know, they're, what are you going to say, they're, they're not of Apple quality for the most part. Yeah, I mean, this, like, you know, what you said, like, if Apple were to allow us to make a different set of compromises, if you had to boil down all of my complaints about Apple's hardware lineup from the last five years or so, that's it. Like, I wish Apple would allow me the choice of different compromises. Because for the most part, they tend to enforce the same compromises on their entire product line, on every member of the family. So for instance, like, you know, all the laptops are now thin and lights which sacrifice ports and now keyboard usability and trackpad usability. <laughs> like, they sacrifice these things in the name of thinness. Uh, and for a lot of people, that's great. It's great to have that as an option in the lineup, but I just wish it wasn't now the only option in the lineup. And I, I think products like this just show that there is still substantial demand, even though, you know, any any given one of these types of things is not going to sell very well, I don't think. But I think it says something that this is not the first thing we've seen like this. And there's also the, the whole 
you know, beyond just like the whole like, you know, new bottom case thing like this that you kind of sit the laptop in there's also the entire ecosystem of all these different USB-C hubs that like almost every macbook one owner has one of these hubs at least one if not like seven from different kickstarters and everything like this really <laughs> says i i think apple sh- I-, I wish apple would would look at these results and and realize like it would be better it would be better for a lot of customers to just have different choices not just to be able to pick your given screen size of the same compromised ultra thin laptop. We are sponsored this week by Away. Go to awaytravel.com slash ATP for twenty dollars off your order. Use promo code ATP during checkout. Away makes basically like modern day, nicely thoughtfully designed luggage at great value prices. So these Away suitcases are made with premium German polycarbonate, which is unrivaled in strength and impact resistance and very lightweight. The interior is incredibly thoughtfully designed. It features a patent-pending compression system. You could fit a lot in there. They, of course, have four full spinning wheels for a smooth ride if you never you never used four four wheeled suitcases it's a pretty big upgrade over two wheeled suitcases they have of course a tsa approved combination lock built to the top uh they also have a couple interesting things like a removable washable laundry bag so when you're out traveling you put all your dirty clothes in this removable washable laundry bag that's built into the suitcase so you always have it with you and it keeps it separate from your from your, from your other clothes and it's easy to take out later and wash uh, and they also, in their carry-on model, this is incredibly thoughtful. You might, you might have heard about this elsewhere. In their carry-on model, they have a built-in USB charging battery. So you can plug in cell phones, tablets, e-readers, and anything else that's USB-powered. You can plug it in and charge it with your carry-on suitcase from Away. Uh, a single charge of the Away carry-on's internal battery can charge your iPhone five times. And if anything ever breaks on these suitcases, Away will fix or replace it for you for life. They have a lifetime warranty. And of course, because you're buying a suitcase on the internet, which sounds kind of weird, they have you covered there too with a 100-day trial. So here's the here's how this works. You can buy it for 100 days. You can live with it. You can even travel with it. So you can actually buy it, travel with it for three months, and then decide after that whether you want to keep it or not. If at any point you decide it's not for you, you can return it for a full refund with no questions asked. So check it out today. These are really thoughtfully designed, well-made suitcases with a lifetime warranty and a 100-day trial. So there's really nothing to lose here. Check it out at awaytravel.com slash ATP and use code ATP during checkout to get $20 off your order. Once again, that's awaytravel.com slash ATP and promo code ATP for 20 bucks off your first order. Thank you very much to Away for sponsoring our show. All right, so we're going to start tonight um, with... <laughs> we're starting tonight? <laughs> well, sort of. Uh, with... A couple, maybe all three of us, iPad grumps talking about Windows or windowing, I guess I should say, on iOS. And um, uh, Stephen Trouton Smith, who is uh, probably the best iOS hacker, and I don't know, I, I hate using that term unironically, but I don't know what else to call him. I don't think he would take offense. Yeah, I, I, and I don't mean it in a disparaging way. Um, anyways, he has been putting together over the last week or so basically a windowing system for iOS, uh, I guess specifically for iPad, and it is absolutely bananas how impressive it looks and how fluid he's gotten it to look. And there are several tweets about, well, there's many tweets about it. We'll put one or two in the show notes. But what's of interest to us, I guess, um, is he he tweeted phone call from app review side by side windows <laughs> fine resizable windows fine overlapping windows scream emoji so <laughs> apparently app review does not like the idea of having two windows or views on top of each other and this relates to uh, one of my favorite iPad apps not necessarily in terms of how much I've used it but just I think it's an unbelievably clever idea which is um, Panic's status board app which if you're not familiar 
is basically you can arrange a series of widgets on the iPad screen and use your iPad as a status board. Or if you want to, you could plug it into a TV and use a whole TV as a status board powered by an iPad. And it's very similar to this. And so Cable Sasser of Panic says, uh, still in our blog, CMS is a never posted goodbye status board post. From the time Apple said widgets are okay, but we can't have more than one widget. And this post included an illustration that may have helped change their minds. And it's an illustration of this humongous TV with a little teeny tiny widget on it trying to make the point of, you know, this is kind of ridiculous. So, I don't know, there's there's kind of a lot to unpack here. But before anything else, I, just, I, I am so unbelievably stunned and impressed by what Stephen Trouton Smith has done with this iPad. I was going to call it a mock-up, but I mean, it's it's working. It's real. It's a tech demo. Yeah, that's a much better term for it. it it's so freaking cool. He basically made Finder. Yeah. Like a really simple version of Finder with with like Finder Windows and, every, and being able to browse files and preview them and everything. It's pretty impressive. It's kind of like the Mac OS X Finder anyway. Not the real Finder, but you know. yeah. And, and, it's, and the point of it is not to be like a useful application. The point of it is I, I think to to show off like here's a, a really easy obvious way that you could do windowing on on iPads and let's see how how it actually behaves and works like is it useful is it easy to do is it confusing or does it just kind of work and so far I, I think it just kind of works you left off the last few tweets here which I think are important both both uh Steve and, and cables thing so Steve continues after his scared face emoji or screaming face I, I didn't know the sorry Casey, I didn't know the correct name of that emoji, and Chrome couldn't handle it, so I couldn't actually paste it. If only we um, so had a resource on this show of somebody who was really an emoji expert. Well, he handled it. He, <laughs> he read right over Scared Face, and he replaced it with the correct, which I assume is the correct one, because we'll just, we'll just defer to him. He's fluent in emoji. Right. <laughs> so um, here. So this is about App Review saying the side-by-side window, you know, overlapping windows is no good, right? So he's saying, effectively... This is merely an informal heads up that if it were to be submitted to the App Store with overlapping windows, it would be rejected. Remember, he's not a submitting an application to the App Store. He's no. just doing like tech demos on Twitter. And he gets a phone call from App Review saying, by the way, if you were to submit that, no. <laughs> All right. And so the final bit here is this is why the iPad can't have nice things. You're stuck waiting for Apple to innovate which is uh, exactly the point of all this. It's like, who knows if this is a good idea? Maybe this is a terrible idea. But if Apple is going to not just enforce a set of guidelines in terms of quality and, and viruses and advertising and you know adult content and all sorts of other things that the App Store does, but to at the level at this level to say, uh, you know, you can do whatever you want if you're making a game and UI kit will let you make a bunch of GUIs, but in the in between place where you try to make your own GUI, we're gonna say no to that, and it's like Apple, you don't know. Like it's a third party application. Maybe it's a terrible idea and everyone will hate it. Maybe it's a great idea and you'll end up stealing it like pull to refresh. You have to allow application developers to do things like this with the devices that you're making. Like this is not a ridiculous notion, right? And and maybe if it was more ridiculous it would be allowed because again, games can like look, I, my whole screen is a big open GL view. I can do whatever the hell I want. And Apple's not gonna be like, Oh, your menu system in this racing game looks a little bit weird. Like, they don't care. It's fine. But this looks too much like a regular UI, and this is not, like, the image that Apple wants for their thing. And I feel like this starts to cross a line of you're not ensuring quality in the App Store. You are constraining, the, you know, you're constraining innovation, like legitimate innovation. Not He's not trolling with this. He's trying out an interface idea, an interface idea that is just as valid as half the other people's terrible uses of UI kit that end up being terrible interfaces. <laughs> Maybe this will be terrible, too. Who knows? But why is this not allowed? But so many other like sketching applications that have like drag off palettes that you can float. It's like, well, that's OK, because the background is your painting or your sketch that you're doing. And that's not a window. And then the things that are floating on top of it are windows, but they can't overlap with each other. It's it's ridiculous. Like and so we are forced to wait for Apple to slowly, but, you know, or perhaps surely, perhaps not decide what it's going to do with this whole window. Okay, pic picture in picture is fine. And Apple do that and make an official API for it. Can we have any other floating windows on top of other windows? Mm, maybe one or two in apps I'll allow, but don't try to solve the whole problem in a general purpose way because only Apple's allowed to do that. So you're, so it, the users of the iPad, the users of iOS are stuck waiting for Apple to figure out what to do. It is impossible for third parties to innovate on iOS devices because Apple simply won't let them. And that is terrible because most of the awesome innovations on the Mac and many of them on iOS came from third-party developers that did something. It became popular. Apple saw it and said, oh, that's a good idea. We should 
build that into the US or incorporate a similar mechanism or, you know, buy super clock and put a clock in the menu bar. I mean, come on, come on, Apple. This is super disappointing, especially since they are proactively dickish about it. Calling him and saying, <laughs> you, you better not submit that to the app well, store because we'll reject it just so you know. Well, hold on though. Was that, I don't think that was out of the blue and, and I might have this wrong, but my interpretation, which may be my own fabrication, was that he had submitted it for um, like test flight or something and so as part of that, he got like a little mini review and it was then that it was brought to Apple's attention and then that they called him and were like, oh, no, that's not going to work. But either way, like but whether even if he had officially submitted it, the bottom line is that they are they're saying you are not allowed to innovate in this way, which I think is ridiculous. Let the app die on its own if it's a terrible idea. Right. It's not it. You know, it's not malware. <laughs> Well, so there's there's been this rule, and I, I just checked; it's still there. Uh, there's been this rule, this app review rule, since I think the first publication of app review rules back whenever that was, like 2009, 2010, and uh, it's rule number two five eight: apps that create alternate desktop or home screen environments or simulate multi app widget experiences will be rejected. I know, like Launch Center Pro had that problem a while back too. I think that rule rule is bogus too. Right? Oh, I think but, so too. But but I think it's worth it's worth questioning why that rule is there, and it might just be some like you know crazy Steve Jobs control freak holdover. But there also might be good reasons for it. So it might be, for instance, like they don't want like another app to basically like start like its own entire app ecosystem within itself. Like although it's you can kind of argue that's kind of what like WhatsApp do does and everything. But uh, and Snapchat anyway. Um, Facebook, geez. Uh, anyway, but um, I think there's probably like this rule is probably not helping innovation overall. Like this, this is probably holding things back. Now that being said, you know, for for any kind of like windowing system like this to get anywhere, the way to do it on iOS is for Apple to do it. Like it's it's never going to get anywhere, you know, in the market like this. Well, I disagree. If it was actually a good idea and it was implemented in a popular or soon to be popular, widely used creative application, like, for example, if Adobe Illustrator came and it had tear off pouts that you could overlap and rearrange just like the desktop one. Right. Uh, they would be disallowed under the under these stupid overlapping rule things because you can overlap two pouts with each other. But if it was popular in that application and, and people liked it on on their big iPad Pro, every competitor application would be scrambling to implement that. Any new competitor in the market would say, if I want to make a professional vector drawing application on the 12-inch the iPad Pro, I need to have these floating overlapping palettes because the market leader has them and everybody loves them. And if I don't have them, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. let the idea live and die on its own. Uh, I agree that if you're going to say, okay, well, individual applications get every window, only Apple can do that, period. And that's fine. But just to see if the, bearing out the idea of like, is it is it ridiculous to have people poking their fingers at window widgets? Is this a dumb idea? Does it not work in, in a touch interface? Like the only way you will know is by trying. You can think about it. You can do the mental exercise and be like, oh, I don't want to drag around a window with a title bar. How would I arrange them? How does it work? You have to try. Like, I feel like it's this is the role of third party developers. If someone wants to muck with that and see if it's useful, I think you can get a result that says either this is useful and maybe it would be even more useful if applied broadly by Apple. But even just within the confines of an application, just like the floating pallets that are in a lot of applications now where there's one floating thing that you can tear off and move around, that I think it's pr is proving its own utility because you don't know where it has to be. And if it's always stuck to the side, it's kind of difficult. Let the person move it around so it's out of their way when they're drawing, but it lets them sort of configure their tool set and you know, push it off to the side where they want it. Like I think that is an idea that is showing its value merely when confined to third-party applications and this is just taking to the next step and maybe it's a step too far and it's a terrible idea but apple you just got to let people try it have you seen uh panel kit which is apparently an open source framework to do these kind of like snap to the side and like sticky popover panel sort of things there's a really good um animated gif that's on the readme for this thing and we'll put a link in the show notes but it's not exactly apples to apples what Steve Trout and Smith was doing, but it's very much of a similar spirit. And it looks really like I haven't looked at the code, but just the demonstration looks really good. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the more productive conversation to have on, on this kind of thing is not like how we can get Apple to let it through app review, because let's face it, they won't. Or if, if they suddenly have a change of heart on an ancient rule like this, uh, it won't be because of us. But uh, I think it's worth... All these things, panel kit and Steve Trout and Smith, uh, you know his his thing, whatever. It doesn't even have an official name. <laughs> I don't even I don't know. Think so. uh, 
you know, I, I think it's it's worth talking about, and I think this is probably why he made it, it's worth talking about, like, does this work on iOS? And do you think there's a future of windowed apps in some form like this on on iPads? I don't know. So, yeah, on, on that topic, like, because I brought this up several shows back when, what was it we were talking about that had the floating thing? It was when we were originally talking about picture in picture, and there was some application that also had a floating uh, oh, thing on top idea. of it. Oh, I don't know. You got all the references. <laughs> <laughs> it was a thing that we took. Come on, chat room. Marco <laughs> will cut this out as we discover it. What was it? Uh, floating iPad keyboard. See? See? Oh, that thing. Okay, you're right. Yeah, it was a floating keyboard. That I'm pretty sure Steve Troutman-Smith also found. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a secret, a hidden API, a private API for to, to put a keyboard that wasn't just the bottom of your screen that slid up from the bottom, but rather was a floating keyboard that was much smaller that you could move wherever you wanted on the screen. And that's that made me say, this is kind of like a window. And we have another example of that, which is picture in picture, but it's another kind of window, basically a little square that's on the screen that you can move wherever you want it, more or less within constraints, blah, 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 blah. Which is different than the traditional iOS experience, which is a panel comes in from a side or goes out from whatever, but you can't move it around, right? And that that was me uh, initiating the larger discussion about Windows with a lowercase w on iOS, spawned by this, you know, hidden keyboard type thing. And we also talked about some existing iOS applications like drawing applications that also have floating palettes, usually only one of them, and it floats over the background, which is your drawing. But that is a thing that a lot of people are trying. And what I was trying to pitch them was that uh as if you want to keep taking the ipad even more and more pro uh in addition to making the screen bigger and especially when you do make the screen bigger you want to make better use of that screen and one proven way to let people make use of a larger screen is to give them different regions of it to do things more than just splitting it up into halves or thirds or whatever but even within an application to be able to move things around to arrange things the way they want them now the thing i'm going to add to this conversation here is based on things that have been discussed on other podcasts uh starring uh mike hurley but also on well in cortex that's also him and cgb great talking about their multi-ipad type things and all the, for all the people out there who use it's multi-pad at the same time. come on yes mm-hmm. I, I, or or phones and ipads which is just as common where you got the ipad but your phone next to it or whatever very often this is presented as a way to basically to multitask like to say my smaller iPad over here has this thing on it. My bigger iPad has this. My phone has this. So on my phone, I have messages available. On my little iPad, I have, like, Slack. And on my big iPad, I have the thing that I'm doing, right? Uh, CGP Gray often refers to it the same way that people have multiple pieces of paper around their desk at the same time. You have this pile of paper over here. And then the main thing you're working on, then you're referring to your notebook for notes. And you have a book open over here. I think it's more like having multiple desks. <laughs> it's like, I have this desk <laughs> over here. And then I, my left-hand desk and my right-hand desk. Each hand has its own desk. No, it, it's, it, is, it is like papers. Again, if you, if you were writing a paper referring to another thing and had a book open, right? For referring to your notes and had a, a, a reference book open, right? You would do that. Um, now, every time I hear them discuss this, and I'm not caught up on Cortex, so forgive me if this comes up sometime in 2015, Slacker. but every time I hear this discussed in the distant past where I'm living in, in Cortex right now, I keep waiting for one of these two knuckleheads to realize that what they're talking about <laughs> is called Windows. Why do you think we made Windows on personal computers? It was like a desktop, like a literal, like not a literal desktop, but the other meaning of literal, which is figurative, desktop, a metaphorical <laughs> desktop, right? <laughs> Like it's the top of your desk. Like it's not even a distant. It's not even distant. Thing. Like they were talking about the top, <laughs> and then on that desk would be different documents, each of which would be represented by a window that you could move around. The only difference is that it was all within one piece of glass. So you would take the windows slash documents and arrange them how you wanted with the thing you're writing in the middle and the notes you're referring to on the left and an open reference book on the right. Only middle, left, and right would all be on the screen, and so. It's maddening to hear people talk about. Oh, I have my big <laughs> iPad and my little iPad. You're, those are just windows, but they're physical now. And it's and in some respects, it's better to have physical windows. Like it is more. There are advantages to physical windows. But imagine if your whole desk was a freaking giant retina screen, and you could arrange these windows. We'll call them, and you'd have your little phone and your. And they're just differently sized windows, guys. You're just reinventing <laughs> windows in meat space. They're just meat space windows, and like. It's so painful to me to see, and and I know they'll say like I don't want that. I don't want windows. Window, wi- you know, window arrangement sucks. Arranging my two iPads on my desk is great, <laughs> and there is. I'm not going to say there is something to that because 
dealing with physical devices is better than dealing with Windows. There are compromises to having them all be virtual on a 2D device, but there are also advantages, really, really big advantages. And people with long experience with using very large screens with lots of windows on them, hello, that's me, can tell you that they're all, <laughs> there are also advantages to that approach. And so I'm not saying one precludes the other and you have to stop the other one. I'm just saying they are siblings. They are, they are solving the same problem in almost exactly the same way with only slightly different compromises. And if they're going to say that, that the multi-device thing is the way they prefer versus the other one, that's fine. But to never mention the other one and never realize that what they're essentially doing is exactly the same as having a really big screen with multiple windows and that there are advantages to having a really big screen with multiple windows in that virtual things are easier to deal with and manipulate than real things like you can't switch spaces and you can't swipe your four fingers to the left and suddenly a new desk slides in with a new set of ios devices on it like casey does with his spaces right you can't minimize uh, or window shade or or snap them to edges or resize them because you can't make your ipad mini into a different land different orientation or a different size like there there are trade-offs to be sure and i'm not saying one is dominant over the other but as a strong strong proponent of the virtual pieces of paper as uh, you know as a, a better approach for me personally than the physical pieces of paper or the virtual screens aka windows instead of the physical screens aka ios devices i think this has to be in the mix and that's why when i say see steve trout and smith's like let's make some windows on ios devices i say yes yes finally because if apple ever does make a 27 inch ipad an approach that i think would appeal to a lot of people is to be able to have different overlapping resizable things to so that you're not it was who wants to split a 27 inch screen into thirds or halves or quarters or like i know everyone loves tiling window managers on linux or whatever but there's a reason they have not taken the world by storm right not that overlapping windows is the greatest either they have anti-patterns too and people do like to zoom everything to full screen but i feel like this is an avenue that has to be pursued it may not be the ultimate answer and it may be some hybrid of panels and snapping actually is the the best compromise for most people but you have to pursue it because it has proven utility we all sit in front of max all day and somehow somehow we manage to get work done in this chaos of overlapping (laughs) windows where we can never tell what the hell's going on and we're the janitor like somehow we do it right so i I desperately want to see this avenue pursued, but pursued in every every way by third-party application developers, by Apple experimenting, and yes, by Apple doing things in the OS and releasing larger iOS devices. And for all you multi-iOS device users, oh, you're butchering. I kind of say more power to you because you are kind of like the steampunk uh, of multiple windows <laughs> because you, like they're steampunk <laughs> windows basically. They're steam-powered. Uh, they're physical manifestations of Windows, and they're ugly and dirty and grimy, and they're made of brass, but you like them, so go for it. Add some beard oil. <laughs> wow. John, I love you. That was incredible. Oh, my word. I, I feel like this episode's done. We're, we're done. Good night, everybody. That's <laughs> well, it. I mean, it's do you, over. Do you, do you guys get what I was saying with the multiple windows? Like, I, I, yeah, I don't yes, know how, where yes. you guys fall on multi-devices versus multiple windows, and I know you're not as gung-ho on multiple windows no. as I am. Multiple but, like, devices is a terrible solution to this problem. It is, you know, in many, in, in some contexts, if you're trying to do certain things as an iOS power user, sometimes it's the only solution to the problem. But, you know, I, I think, and, and granted, you know, to be fair to the, the multi-pad lifestyle people, uh, I don't think... This is the only reason they do that. It's not just to have two different applications running at the same time. There's other reasons why they would have multiple devices. Um, for you know, the same reason that many of us have multiple Macs, like you know, to have like a big one and a small one for travel versus home, you know, like stuff like that. So all those things aside, and I and honestly, I think running two apps side by side on two different iPads is probably a fairly uncommon use of, of multiple devices that from the people who have them. But um, if you can picture a future of a future version of iPad multitasking where you could just resize the apps, not just with the split view that we have now, where you just you, you can have at most two apps on screen, if you don't count picture and picture video playback as one of them. So you, you have at most two apps on screen and they can only be arranged left and right in just different split sizes that are like three different preset sizes that they can possibly be. That's very limited. It's a lot better than having no multi-window environment on the, on the iPad like we had before iOS. What was it, 9 out of that? It's a lot better than that, but it's it's not nearly as powerful as having a more free-form system like overlapping windows or just more... Than, just, you know, e- even if it has to only be tiling windows and so they can't ever overlap. Even if that's the case, 
iPad screens are a lot bigger than phones, and any universal app is made to scale from an iPhone 5S all the way up to uh, an iPad 12.9. Why can't you have like six windows on screen? Like ha- have it be like a three by two grid on the 12.9 inch. Each one would be about the size of a moderately sized iPhone. Uh, why couldn't you do something like that? Like have six apps open at once or have four apps open at once where they're all small rectangles or something like that. Like I feel like there's so many more places iPad multitasking can go. And granted, there's a few fundamentals that really need to be built first before that makes a lot of sense. Things like drag and drop uh, and some kind of more coherent file system access in some form. Uh, but ultimately multiple applications being open at once and not just two of them is is the direction this has to go for these devices to become more productivity powerhouses yeah and i i think you know john and or john i think that mike and and cgp gray would both say that that this is a terrible solution like i i i think one of you said that a minute ago but it's important since they're not here to defend themselves to stress that i don't think that they love the solution it's just that they do love ios and they're hamstrung by the the things that ios lets you do and i feel similarly i mean i do love my ipad but i've been really really strongly kicking around the idea of getting a macbook adorable expressly because i want something that's effectively as portable as an ipad or as close as i can get to that but that doesn't make me feel hamstrung every time I use it. And to me, the best answer to that question is a MacBook adorable. For them, I don't think they feel near as hamstrung in general. The problem is simply that they can only do but so many things at once. And so uh, it, for them, it, it does make sense to to live the multi-pad lifestyle. I think it's a little bit kooky, but just because I think that doesn't mean that it wouldn't work for them. And clearly it does. The most common multi-device thing I would imagine is a personal computer style device and your phone because like i said there are there are definite advantages to steampunk windows uh and one of them is <laughs> you you compartmentalize the thing so very often it's text messaging whatever your text messaging services of choice text messaging on your phone while doing other things on your computer and it, your computer may have messages on it or maybe it doesn't have whatever app you're using or maybe you don't choose not to get messages but that division of labor you're sitting somewhere you know, sitting in a coffee shop, typing something on your computer and you get a text message and you look at it on your phone, that that steampunk window, it's physically in a different location. You're in a portable scenario where you can't have a gigantic 30 inch drafting board, you know, Surface Book Pro. Like you can't have that. You're you're on the go. It is a, a different sight line, a different focal distance. It is a physical device that you're used to texting people from. All your past texts and the apps that you love are on there. Using that as, as a steampunk window to do your uh your texting is perfectly valid and probably is an advantage over trying to cram your messages window onto your 12 inch macbook uh screen next to the thing that you were trying to write in your distraction free writing environment right so like <laughs> i i get it i get why there are, I, I do it myself sometimes when i'm at work sometimes at work i will send and receive text messages on my phone even though I could be getting them on my Mac screen, just because it is a nice compartmentalization of work versus personal, you know, texting over who's going to pick up what kid from what activity or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, it makes sense to me to do that. Starts to make less sense when you're in an environment where you, where you have a big desk and a raid on your desk, you have a series of iOS devices of different sizes, because then then I feel like you're compromising uh, in ways. And, you know, I, I, who is this? Casey saying like they're using iOS because they want to. Uh, and I understand that, and they have to do this because they're limited in their multitasking, and they more than anyone would like richer multitasking. So I'm not, I'm not slamming them for saying you should just use Windows because you can't, you can't use it on iOS. And if you want to use iOS devices, there we're stuck waiting for Apple to innovate. There, it's just frustrating to me that we seem to be creeping. Users are organically creeping up on on that solution, uh, and that the solution is much bigger iOS devices suitable for a desktop environment that supports something like Windows that gives. The users more flexibility in how they arrange their space. Everybody does it. This is one of my big things with the whole spatial fonda rant. Everybody arranges their workspace, especially if it's a job you're doing all the time, whether it is a carpenter arranging their tools or an artist arranging their palettes and their paints and their brushes and their easel, like and having every or, or a chef setting aside all the ingredients that they're gonna, you know, use in their thing. Like Everybody arranges their workspace. Efficient workers do arrange their workspace. We all do it on our computers now. We all have different arrangements and different amounts of things. And whether you use spaces or not, or tiling window manager or not, or maximize everything and flip through them with your fingers, or alt-tab through things, or click, like, 
that's a thing that we're going to do no matter what we do with we do it with windows we do it with our steampunk windows we do it in the physical world and i think no matter what our interface to work is it has to allow us to do that in some way and so you know mike and, and cgp gray and everyone else who's living the multi-pad lifestyle they're doing it the only way that is available to them with the tools that they like but i think uh we have to acknowledge the other approach is fairly well proven at this point for a certain set of users it is disproven for a certain set of users as well because we all know that novice users the reason why they love ios is because it doesn't let them have to deal with this crap they don't get all confused by a bunch of windows right but for a certain set of users you know if you were to tell someone that they had to you know uh do 3d animation for pixar but they weren't allowed to use windows they just had to use everything full screen or a split screen they would have a much harder time getting their job done i would imagine also, I mean, like one of their like side benefit, like if Apple were to do windowing on iPads, it would also solve a tremendous problem of the iPad app ecosystem where iOS apps are often not very well optimized for the iPad or aren't optimized for it at all. And sometimes they're really big apps like Instagram, uh, where which famously like still does not have an iPad app and also shut down the API that allowed other iPad apps to exist for them. Uh, imagine if... Instead of having the you know the the dumb like you know giant letterboxed iPhone simulator version on iPad, what if you launched a non iPad optimized app and it just launched in a in an iPhone sized window and you could drag it around and you could have other apps that you could shrink down to that size and tile around your screen if you wanted to like almost every iPad app that is a universal app with its phone version can again it can scale to all these different sizes. You could solve problems like this very, very well. Also, things like, you know, when Apple does make larger iPads, like there's still a lot of iPad apps that aren't optimized for the 12.9. What if when you launch one of these things on a 12.9, it just launched in a 9.7 sized window and it was just one of many windows on your screen? Like there are there are lots of benefits to this. And, and granted, there's a lot of UI challenges and, and a lot of probably technical challenges of things like how do you manage memory for all these different apps that could be you know, appearing to be running all at once uh, and be in the foreground all at once. And lots of API challenges with things like touch handling and what what kind of gets the attention and what doesn't. And there's some weirdness already with like multitasking of like if you have a keyboard uh, connected and you have you know two and you have two different apps open right now during multitasking and you hit a shortcut key on the keyboard, which app gets it? And right now, I think it's just like whatever app you, you tapped last or something. But it's like, but there's no active state on the title bar to indicate which one that is. So you just have to know or guess or try it. So like, if they were to go in a direction like this that that brought like full blown windowing in some form or full blown multitasking like this to iOS, there is a lot of work to be done. It's not a small task. It, it is a. It, this is not something they could do in you know likely one release. You know this is like a massive undertaking. Uh, and they've already done some of it, but doing a more freeform system like what we're describing would require a lot more of it. But I think the result would be pretty great and and incredibly powerful and would really revive the iPad for productivity use, which it, it does seem like Apple needs something to do that. That would be great. And that would also, you know, if, if, we, if we do it the way I was saying, where like, you know, non-optimized apps would just launch in old device-sized windows, that could also solve this major market and software ecosystem problem that the ipad also faces so like this would be a really great solution in a number of ways the only question is like would they ever do it would they would it be worth devoting the resources to and would they then just be recreating the mac poorly you know like the old like the old lisp joke like or unix or whatever probably applies to everything they should be recreating the mac better they should be learning from the mac and, and you know making it better faster like you know the six million dollar man type of thing they should like <laughs> they, trying to slowly convert the mac into a thing like into a thing that is better than mac is difficult but ios you know is a relatively clean slate they they can reconsider everything they can only bring over the things that are good they can make different compromises they can skew it in a particular direction they can make they can try to make it so users who can't deal with lots of windows don't have to like make get shave off the sharp corners because you've seen everyone's seen someone struggle to manage windows on a personal computer but you know the lowercase w again whether it's on the mac or on the pc 
even in on the PC where everything is full screen and people are alt tabbing, there's still some confusion about floating things and layering and dialogue boxes that appear and where did it go and mission, you know, uh, mission control and formerly expose and all that was supposed to help with that. And all those are great things. Those are all things to learn from, uh, finding the right compromise for iOS devices where most of the time it works the way most people want it to, but that the more advanced users have the ability to, to get the productivity advantages that, that these people are currently getting with multiple physical devices uh that's that's the balance that apple should strike and i think it's great to do that on ios where you are not constrained by even making something like steven's thing here where it looks like a, a mac window who says the title bars are the right thing who says that the window should have window widgets what about scroll bars? like you can rethink everything but yeah i'm thinking broadly speaking like you were saying applications running simultaneously as we get more and more ram becomes much more viable and figuring out what that means as screens get bigger letting people divide up the screen space the way they want to divide it up among the applications that they want to run. Um, and then eventually gets in, you know, you can decide is space is the right approach to this thing. What about preserving the arrangement? Because sometimes if you do side by side windows, but then you go off and do something else. How do you get back into that side by side arrangement? Or maybe you want to go back to just one application and not be in the side by side arrangement. Uh, there are so many things that are still un- undetermined and it's young and they haven't made a lot of decisions yet. So I think it's fine. But, you know, as Marco pointed out, they already painted themselves into weird corners where like, oh, we allowed multiple things on the screen and we allowed keyboard shortcuts, but no- we never thought of a way to indicate which one is the has the focus. So already we're in a weird situation like you should they should think more of those through before they take the next step. Maybe they are. Maybe they're like we don't want you to do this because we have this awesome idea that's going to be out in five years and we don't want you stomping on it. But <laughs> I think it's silly. I think you should let third party developers uh go nuts and and figure out what works and maybe you get some good ideas from them we are sponsored this week by squarespace make your next move with a beautiful website from squarespace almost everything we do today uses a website you need a website for any kind of online store or blog or portfolio or business or new project or podcast almost everything that you would do needs a website these days But it's not really worth installing a whole CMS and building the entire thing from the ground up and having to manage a server and having to manage software updates and everything else and then having having to hire somebody to custom design it for you. That's so much overhead and hassle and cost and time when really you should just have the website be taken care of as quickly and easily as possible and then move on to to your actual project that you're actually building the website for. Squarespace lets you do that. Whether you're making a site for yourself or for somebody else who's asked you to make a site, because if you listen to the show, you probably know how to make websites, and you've probably had people in your life ask you to make them for them. Squarespace is so much better than any other option out there for making most websites. Because they have built-in templates, they have built-in widgets and capabilities, so much is built in that you can do a remarkable amount in less than an hour. Like, I, I challenge you, next time you have to make a website for anybody, for yourself or somebody else, try it on Squarespace first. Give me the benefit of the doubt here. Try it there first and just see how far you get in an hour or less even. And I bet you're going to get so far that you're going to decide, you know what? This is done. Like this, is, Or you can finish it like in another hour and then you're done. That's it. No matter what your skill level, whether you're a novice or whether you're a web programmer, you can get so much done with Squarespace. You can make a beautiful website. It looks professionally designed. And it stays up because they keep they they manage it for you. They support it. If you're making for somebody else, it's very important. They support it. Uh, you don't have to worry about all the back end stuff. They take care of it, and your site looks awesome. Check it out today. Start a free trial with no credit card required at Squarespace.com. When you decide to sign up, make sure to use the offer code ATP to get ten percent off your first purchase. Make your next move with Squarespace. Speaking of iPad woes. <laughs> uh, Apple, God, we're going to get so much anger from the iPad people. I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, we shouldn't. We all said good things about the iPad. Yeah, and the good thing is, like, the Cortex hosts have now moved on from talking about the multipad lifestyle. Now they're both just slowly becoming programmers, but they're both in denial of that fact. Yep. They both just kind of keep inching more and more towards, like, guys, you're actually just becoming programmers, and it's okay, <laughs> and that's good. There, It turns out there's a way to automate our computing tasks. <laughs> <laughs> you just write these little things. Uh, you could call them, hmm, I don't know, programs. Yeah, it reminds me of some, uh, what did I see? Some, somewhere in some business snark website thing talking about uh, specifications for software projects. Like if you write up the requirements 
right? And you'd write up the requirements, and you, you typically the requirements like I want to do blah blah blah, and it's like that's too vague. I don't know exactly what you want, so you go back and forth about the requirements. Do you want, how do you want it to work? No, how do you really want it to work? Do you want it to work like this, work like that? And eventually, the business person getting frustrated, and it's like, look, just I, I'm going to tell you exactly how I want it to work with no ambiguity. And it's like, if you do that, what you've done is write a program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, eventually, it, to specify it, that's what programmers do. Like, people just want to specify it and like, and yada, yada, you start all the details. And the computer, you can't yada, yada. You have to say, no, how exactly <laughs> do you want it to work? All right, I'm going to tell you exactly how you want it to work. In every in every condition, here's what you should do, blah, 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 blah. It's like, that's program. That's called programming. You are you you want to be a programmer now. So go ahead, all right? Go for you it. Can, you can very quickly find yourself becoming a programmer with an accidental programming podcast becoming a programmer without knowing it because eventually <laughs> you'd be like getting down to a level of detail where you're telling it i'm going to tell you about every possible eventuality what you should do that's programming like, <laughs> yeah. computer, computers know it just does what you tell it well i love how like i think i think mike in particular is in this is in a special denial place here of like he makes fun of well not making fun of but like he he talks about the way developers use the terminal and and just geeks use the terminal uh, as this kind of like crazy opaque thing that is this you know incredibly you know geeky obscure uh, th- and, and then and then like they're talking about you like using workflow at, against web APIs to automate certain it's like it's the same thing like it's just different it's a different era of the exact same thing <laughs> like the same kind of learning curve really the same kind of you know similar kind of capabilities uh, as usual the old people like us think the old way was better but you know it, it's really the same kinds of things yeah although i think mike uh, I, and I, I, I my understanding of what mike is doing is that he's largely cribbing what others like federico or cgp gray have done and modifying them a little bit but to build on what you were saying so on the surface you know it sounds like oh mike's not really a programmer at all but really that's how all programmers work is they take something that gets you 80 yeah, percent of the way there and, and fix what you need in order to get the rest of the way and so i agree with you and, and federico to me is is the king of this because oh, yeah. he's writing like ridiculous python scripts and these like hyper involved workflows with like potentially even recursion within them and it's just he he is a developer we actually federico and i in in a happy way had this fight like i don't know two or three months ago where i said to him dude you are a developer at this point like don't even try to pretend you're not and and he didn't want to hear it not in a jerky way he just was like oh i'm not a developer i I don't know how to do the stuff you guys do i'm like you're doing it it's not even a question it's already happening yeah in the same way Uh. like that our friend dr drang is you know like Dr. Drang post on uh, leadingcrew.com and like he's not a programmer by trade but he writes tons of scripts most of which are in python to do all sorts of things for his work and so like he while he while he probably does not consider himself a programmer he uses programming he knows a programming language and he he uses it to get tasks done for his work and there's lots of room for that type of person you know just like Look, I mean, like Microsoft Office has uh, has forever had its macro language, right? It's that's the same thing. That's just Visual Basic. Like it's the same. That that's also programming. My first job was programming VBA in a giant Excel spreadsheet for some company to save them a bunch of time. Like that's that's a lot of what programming in the real world actually is. Is like people doing like little custom or one off things. That is programming. There's kind of this continuum of like power users. Like they first, the first thing you learn as like a power user is you might learn like a keyboard shortcut for for some common stuff. And you're like, oh my god, this is great. And then eventually, you might learn some kind of automation of something. Like you know, first you kind of figure out like how do you do manual work faster, right? That that's like the keyboard shortcut approach. Then you start figuring out like how do I actually like use the computer's immense speed and power to do things faster than I could do them manually. And that's when you start getting into like the basic things like batch operations in pro apps. Um, on the Mac, you'd have things like Automator. And on the iPad, you have things like Workflow. Uh, and then eventually, I feel like the next step after that is like, no, you're actually just writing code of some sort. Whether it's just a simple thing like a shell script uh, or a JavaScript thing or whether it's actually like, you know, a Ruby or Python, like what we'd call like a real language uh, script or app to, to do something custom. Like this is just these are all just points on the the power user curve. And being a programmer is not like some special boundary that you have to like go to college to know how to do. No, it's just like it's just the next step on that curve 
after you've used tools like Workflow or Automator and you, you kind of want a little bit more customization or a little bit more power. And then you get into these things that really are programming. Uh, you just might not realize it until after you've been doing it for a while. Yeah, Mike and Vitici would both be uh, making hypercard stacks 30 years ago. I don't know, you, guys don't, you guys don't remember that era, but I used hypercard. Yep, same here. There used to be many more yeah, back back before Apple and most of the rest of the industry gave up on the idea of trying to make programming easy enough for people who didn't want to be into programming. There were many many attempts. Apple Script is one of them um, to try to make programming more accessible to the masses. Uh, with something that is farther along that curve that actually is a real programming language, but is a, a language that looks friendlier or whatever. Um, and lots of people made hypercard stacks. And like it's another accidental programmer thing where, sure, people made hypercard stacks. And most people, it wasn't easy enough for them to tackle. But many people who didn't consider themselves programmers were like, they weren't intimidated by hypercard and like, oh, I'll, I'll go through these tutorials. Oh, I can make a button. Oh, I click a button and it makes a beeping noise. Like, and, you know, and, for someone trying to make a button on a Mac of that era was much harder <laughs> if you were using the, the Mac toolbox than it was in HyperCard. And so they could be successful pretty quickly. And for the people who had, who were into that, who were like, they, they, they never thought of themselves as programmers, but it turns out if you introduce them to it, fast forward three months and they're writing this incredibly complicated HyperCard stack using HyperTalk like a real programmer. And they have suddenly found themselves. It's not everybody who does. It's not like it turns people into programmers. It reveals programmers that were always there. Right. <laughs> and they just, you know what happens with someone who is, is, who is like just naturally wants to do this. They start off with the beeping button and you just, you just step away for like a couple of weeks and you come back and it's like, what have you done? And like, they have made this entire <laughs> world for themselves and well, they, they have no missed. formal education. They don't know what a right. subroutine is. They don't know any theory about data structures, or but they're like deriving from first principles, the basics of programming and hyper talk and, you know, doing incredible. Th I saw it all the time doing incredible things. And it's like someone who runs a general store and makes a hypercard stack to do their inventory. And it's like, you may not know it, but you are now a programmer. And this is the thing you could have done as a profession, even though you have no formal education in it and really still don't quite know what you're doing in the formal sense. But you are you are rediscovering the rudiments of, of programming with no instruction from anyone else, merely by having a box in front of you and knowing some basic things. And that is that is a beautiful thing to see. And I love hearing stories of like places that are still running hypercard stacks and like their Mac SEs just because like they run their entire business on it and somebody wrote it years ago. I guess that's not. I guess it's more heartwarming because I know it. It's not quite as heartwarming for people who are still running their payroll on COBOL or whatever. But I think Y2K <laughs> took care of a lot of those. Uh, but but either way, like that, for for people who are listening who th think they will never be programmers, um, it that's possible. You may never be it, but I, it's like it's like a, there's a reason people call it like the programming bug. Like you get bitten by it, and you just find that happens to all of us here on this podcast, I'm sure, and everyone else who's into computers. At some point, you get exposed to something, and it just you know it sinks its teeth into you and you lose track of time you lose track of the years and you realize this is just this whole world that you bury yourself into some people are exposed to the exact same thing are like meh not for me right um but the distinction between those people has nothing to do with education or even desire it is just like how their brains work if is programming addicting to you uh you will know that pretty quickly and you look at someone like Vitici, guess what programming is addicted to him like he would not be doing these things if he it, like it, he's bitten so hard by this. Like the, the he's mad with the power of being able to, to, to help the computer to do what he wants it to do in a series of sophisticated ways, breaking down the problem into smaller pieces and recombining them. Right? He's bitten by it so hard. Just because he's not writing C doesn't mean that he has not a bitten by the programmer bug and b become a programmer. Well, and I feel like. That's the whole beauty of computers is like when you when you break that barrier between like when I was saying on my curve about like when you're just doing manual things faster versus when you have the computer start working for you and way faster than you ever could manually. The whole beauty of computers is the ability to cross that line, the ability to do that. Like when like the, the famous Steve Jobs quote about the computer is a bicycle for the mind, like it's not because you know that you know all the shortcut keys to do things repetitively over and over again. It's because you can just like put in some just the right kind of input and this computer can just skyrocket past you executing that code way, way, way faster and more reliable and more consistently than you ever could or doing things that you could never do in a practical amount of time. Like, And it's just like one of the reasons why I get frustrated when 
things like you know iOS move or start in directions where things are really locked down and it's hard to do that kind of stuff is because I feel like that's kind of missing or or kind of like blowing the whole advantage that computers have given us as a society. Like the whole point of computers is to enable humans to do thing to 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 have these kind of you know information based tasks done in in ways and at speeds and in volumes that we could never do on our own like through manual calculations or anything else and for any computer platform to be truly empowering to its users it has to allow that in some way and hopefully in in a reasonably easy and capable way and efforts to do that on ios are are really really held back by just the limitations of ios and things like workflow and pythonista like they the, these things have existed and do exist and and are, are good for people but there's so much further to go to to make them even just match the level of power and sophistication that regular people can achieve on you know windows or a mac uh, let alone like on you know future things that we might think of, of even better ways to do these things and so that that's kind of like it, it kind of hurts me philosophically whenever it appears the computing platform is going in the opposite direction. And, and what most of these people are doing, by the way, like the, in the continuum is that they, you can use tools made by other people, which is what the App Store is great, like it gives regular people access to tools that other people have made for doing common tasks. Hey, so you've, you know, you're taking the inventory of all the books that are on your shelves. There's an app that you can just point your phone at it and we'll look up, you know, so on and so forth. Like it's a tool to do a job better, right? The, the next step along that is, I don't see any tool that does the thing that I wanted to do. I'm going to make my own tool. So it's not just that they're automating repetitive tasks, but that they are building a tool for them to do whatever real-world tasks they're doing, whether it's managing their business or doing their hobby, keeping track of their model trains or controlling their model trains or whatever. Like They don't see the thing that they want in the world, and they realize they can make this thing do what they wanted to do it. So they build a tool for themselves. And it doesn't mean they have to suddenly become an app developer and sell that thing or whatever. It's just like the people who use a FileMaker database to manage their you know, retail store or something where they sell cameras. They don't consider that they're making a tool to do, to accomplish some other task. That's just another point in the line. Using other people's tools versus saying uh, no one else makes this tool or the tools they make aren't to my liking and I can make my own tool to do it. Vitici is essentially making his own tools for his workflow because there's no existing thing that integrates all the different pieces the way he wants them to do, and he has specific needs about it. And so, you know, it's not just, you know, in some cases he is automating something you have to do manually, but in other cases, like he's, it's not application development, but it's, it's tool building. And we all do that. We're smart little monkeys that use a stick to, you know, hit something instead of our hands because the stick is better, <laughs> right? You know, it's, it's all, all, you know, <laughs> a bicycle for the mind has more poetry than, uh, uh, a, a wooden stick for <laughs> a the monkey mind, with a but, stick <laughs> yeah or the you know the, the monkey with the bone from 2001 but that's basically what it boils down to and taking away the ability to or you know not taking it away but making the barrier to making your old tools mean like either you get to use tools other people made giant giant gap x code that gap is too big <laughs> um yeah it's too big for most people to cross, and there, it, you know, think, apps like Workflow show that there is, or, or even Automator, or simple scripting languages, or anything like that, or or HyperCard, or all that stuff. Even though most of the experiments failed in in what they thought the goal would be, like everyone's going to be a programmer. Nope, that's not going to happen, right? But you do need something on that middle tier for the people who are never going to graduate all the way up to being a full fledged programmer and using Xcode. But they don't need to. They just need something in the middle that can, you know, they can let them make the tools to make their life better even though their goal in life is not to be an application developer and they never need to make something in S code and submit it to the app store so apple and education bringing Speaking this back around. A slight si- slight sidetrack <laughs> yeah for after that that 45 minute sidetrack um, wait was that the topic believe it or not because, because then we got into saying how people with ipads are going to be mad at us and we just get buried back in ipads again that's right they're all secret programmers all right <laughs> Right. So anyway, so Apple and Education, uh, there's a New York Times article that says, um, that, well, the headline is Apple's devices lose luster in American classrooms. And uh, I didn't get a chance to read the article, but my understanding is basically that um, there are fewer devices being shipped to schools for uh, from Apple. It seems like Microsoft is slightly on the up and Google, thanks to Chromebooks, are is way on the up 
um, which is great, I guess, for Google and kind of a bummer for Apple since this used to be our, their stronghold. I mean, I think I can speak for Marco in saying my only exposure to a Mac or to an Apple II was at school. Like, I didn't have any friends that had one. Um, it was always at school that, that I was exposed to it, and that seems to be changing now. It seems to be all Chromebooks. But well, I don't know. <laughs> my, my experience was slightly different in that my first exposure to Apple computers was indeed at school, but it was to the Apple II, in the early 90s. The heyday of the Apple II. Yeah, my school was so poor that the only computers they could they had were like ancient hand-me-down Apple IIs, most of which were not even like, you know, the the later models. They were like, you know, the old like, you know, green and black one, like, you know, before color and things like memory. Uh, it, it, they were, <laughs> it was, pr- it was, you know, pretty, pretty basic, but I loved them because they were the only computers I'd ever used up to that point. And they were amazing even in like 1992, whenever that was. Uh, but, and then after that, like when I, I um, a few years later, I went to a different school and they had just PCs because at that point that was like, that was like 93 ish and 94. And by that point, like, you know, Macs, I think were too expensive for most schools at that point. And, I think like most schools, there was like, we had like, there was one Mac in one of the computer labs that you weren't allowed to use unless you were in some kind of like graphic design class that like they, they could use it. But otherwise it was all PCs for the same reason that we're probably about to talk about, which is cost. Because when you're in schools, cost is a really, really big factor. So, I mean, this article, uh, the news in this article and the graphs in this article, it's not a surprise to Apple. Apple knows all these things. Apple knows how much it's selling. Apple knows how much its competitors selling. And the graph they show is only from uh, 2012 to 2016, so it's not a long span. But they show it basically because Google comes out of nowhere, basically like zero market share sometime in 2010 or 11, and flies past both Apple and Microsoft, who are more or less flat, uh, flies past them around 2014, and now is at like four times their sales volume in terms of units, right? So that's in a very short period of time, Google comes out of nowhere and becomes the dominant player in the market. And the fact that Apple knows that this happened because they keep track of their own stuff, but seemingly has not had a strong response to it. Uh, I know we talk about the pro market mostly on this program, but imagine we were, uh, you know, instead we were very interested in the education market. We would be complaining that Apple has faced a strong competitor in in the form of Google for many years now, and its reaction to it has been half-hearted features to let more than one person use an iPad at the same time by logging in and out and storing crap on iCloud and some improved management stuff and a bunch of new different shapes and sizes of iPads, which all seem like they're good and fine, kind of like their efforts to add like multitasking stuff to the iPad in a different realm. But... If you look at the, you know, ha- has this made them competitive again in the education market or is Google still kicking their butt? Answer, Google's still kicking their butt if you measure things in terms of unit sales. Maybe Apple doesn't measure that. Maybe they, I don't care what the hell the unit sales are. We're making all the money. We make all the profit. That is, I guess, a reasonable place to be in. But when it comes to education, I have to think that you shouldn't really view it as a profit center. Not that you shouldn't make money on it, but like... the. Uh, one of the most important things Apple is getting at it is just what Marco talked about and, and Casey talked about and me too. Like we saw Apple computers in school and it doesn't mean that we're going to grow up to only use Apple computers, but it sure as hell doesn't hurt being familiar with them, getting comfortable with them, uh, conceptualizing computers in terms of what is presented to you. Like this is what a computer is. So, you know, these multiple generations of students who are growing up using Google Docs in school and using Chromebooks uh, maybe they conceptualize Chromebooks as the equivalent of the crappy Apple IIs that are crappy computers they would never buy for themselves that are pieces of junk that are managed by the school and that they have to use for schoolwork. But they are becoming familiar with Google Docs and they are associating Google with computing in a way that they used to be associating Apple with computing. You know, So there are pluses and minuses to being stigmatized as the computer I had to use in school. But I think if Apple, again, if Apple cares about the education market at all, it should not be happy to have its uh, unit sales be flat over the course the same course of time where a competitor comes from zero to squash them by a factor of four like i i don't think that's a good position to be in the market now maybe apple doesn't care and they're willing to just let that ride but how many markets are we going to look at and say 
Apple doesn't really care that much. It's not a big deal. Like, what does Apple really care about? Is it just phones? Because even in the phone market, they're still making all the money and selling lots of phones. And I think doing a great job with their phone hardware, but they're also getting their butt kicking unit sales there, you know, by an increasing percentage by this larger, more open platform. So I don't know what to think. Apple stock is way up. The iPhone is awesome. Everybody loves it. I love it. But when I look at education or the pro markets, maybe it's just nostalgia for the Apple that used to be. But boy, things have sure changed. I, I feel like both education and the pro markets are places that you go when you when you don't have the consumer market. They're kind of they're, they're these nice like holdouts that if you can if you can get market share there, you can have a reasonably sustainable business, even if you you have lost or you never even gain ground in the consumer market. And so when Apple was doing poorly in like the nineties and stuff, they were they retreated to those markets because with with education, you know, and pros to, to some degree, like there's like the, there's special needs, and you can deploy a, a sales force tactically to like you just need a, you know a relatively small number of very big sales to succeed in these markets, and that's not necessarily easy to get, but that's easier than convincing the entire consumer shopping public to buy your stuff if they aren't already interested in it, you know? And so, you know, Apple, I feel like Apple went to these markets not because they thought they were especially important necessarily for things like, you know, oh, your kids are going to use what they, what they are familiar with, but because they were the only ones willing to buy Apple stuff for a long time. And now that that's no longer the case, Apple is seemingly being more managed by numbers these days which is unfortunate if that's true uh, but that is sure how it looks and these days it it you know because they are popular with consumers by so much that they that they can kind of afford to throw away less profitable market segments that is basically what they appear to be doing regardless of whatever Tim Cook's vague statement of the week is about how much they still care about us, the reality is <laughs> that schools are, especially these days, pretty hard to make money. And I mean, again, like Apple's heyday in schools back like in like the late 90s and stuff, that was also at a time, or you know, early 90s too, that was also at a time when technology was new and novel. And schools were getting all sorts of these funding grants for going and getting computers, you know? And granted, not every school, but... Th- there was a lot of like other people's money being poured into like we need to get our kids in technology and it was i feel like it was probably easier to sell into that environment than it is now that computers are no longer new and cool now it's just a budget item and now it's down to okay we really just need things to be cheap and whatever's cheapest and easiest for us to manage and and again cheapest that's what we're going to go with um and so i basically i feel like the conditions are very different now that both Apple needs education and pros less than they used to. And also in the case of the education market, the education market I think now is significantly more price driven, specifically with regard to computers, than it was 20 years ago, you know, back when, when these things were new and there was all this grant money coming in. I think it was always it was always tight for schools. I don't think it's that much of a difference. Like I, I, I would probably agree that schools are not as well funded as they used to be. But I would disagree that price consciousness is a new phenomenon when it comes to computers in schools. Well, and and again, that was also back back in the nineties too. I, I feel like the the difference in price was not as big. Like you know, these back days, nineties, the you're killing me. <laughs> these days, like the difference in price between a Chromebook and a MacBook Pro or any or a MacBook Air, it's like four times. Like that's a, that's a massive multiplier. Like you can literally get like depending on the model of, of Mac that you select, you can get like four to eight Chromebooks for the same price. And it, it, it was worse when your choice was a Macintosh SE or an IBM PC, believe me, or a PC, a PC clone. Gateway 2000 or, or Mac SE, Gateway 2000 or Mac 2CI. It was, it was worse. Really? It was more than like a four to five X multiplier on yes, the price? It was, it was, it was terrible. And the, and the numbers were all bigger. Don't you remember how much? I don't know if you remember how much Max used to. Do, do you remember how much my Macintosh SE cost? I, I wasn't there when you bought it. No, but I. I, I <laughs> but I, like I like back, like in the nineties, a decent PC was about two thousand bucks. All right, so I'm gonna do the calculation here. I don't know. We spent like three or four thousand dollars at least. I thought on on my beloved Pentium Pro 100 megahertz machine. It was a lot of money. 
that's not to say that all of them were necessarily that much money because that was pretty cutting edge at the time. And, you know, it was dad that was buying it for himself and I just never let him use it because I'm a jerk. But that thing was not cheap. Yeah, well, but and, and you know, and schools wouldn't buy the high end ones usually. You know, schools sure. they 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 did have to be conscious of the budget, of course. But basically, my my theory is basically that like the not only was the money a little bit easier to justify spending on computers back then because they were so new and everyone wanted to get their kids computers, but also that you know now the price difference is is so vast between them, and I, I don't think it was as vast back then. It, it, it was for Macs, it was, and mostly because Macs were so much more expensive. So the educational discount, the college educational discount for my Mac SE30, which again is not a color Mac. Color Macs were available, but this was not a color Mac. It was a monochrome Macintosh. But was it still a high-end configuration? It was more high end than the SE or, or, or the Plus, which were still for sale, okay. but still not like not color, which again was a big thing in schools, right? Which is the reason they would buy a color PC, right? So a 1990-ish, $4,300. In $1989 or $1990, that if we convert it to current dollars, that's $8,600 for a monochrome oh computer. No keyboard, no keyboard. The keyboard was $189 in, in $1989 and you had to convert that. <laughs> $8,600 oh for one monochrome God. Macintosh, like the little, you know, the little, you know, iconic like vertical Macintosh thing. You could get a gateway computer for less than $2,000 in 1989 money. Uh, the price difference was just as big, if not bigger, especially because schools needed to have color. That's why they all had Apple II GSs in them, because the Apple II GSs were color. No, but but you you just you just proved my point. Your your price multiplier was like two x, and I would also say that that the gate would like to get a like a, a mid spec gateway. But that, that gateway is color though, with a big color monitor. If I go if I go with like the Mac two with a big color monitor, it's much not worse. for under two thousand dollars in nineteen ninety. If that's a mid spec machine, it's going to be a little over two thousand. So you're basically you're roughly a two x multiplier multiplier which is very different from a 5x multiplier which is basically what we have today i don't we don't have exactly a 5x multiplier now because they get educational discount on these things and they don't buy the top dollar macbook so i think that the, the, i'm talking like 250 bucks versus like 1200 they're not paying 1200 dollars for it and they're also not paying 250 dollars <laughs> for for their things all told but anyway if i was go to like the mac 2fx like a high-end computer that actually had color which again schools wanted colors it gets way way worse much faster like if you add a monitor just adding the cost of the monitor to the thing because you're just buying the mac but that doesn't come with a monitor and it doesn't come with a keyboard the multiplier was worse for mac versus pc than it is for chromebook versus ipad which is the real comparison you should be doing not chromebook versus macbook pro or something no, but I well, I think that's the comparison Apple wants people to do. I, I think Apple wants to present the iPad as the competitor to the Chromebook, but in practice, I don't think it is. I, I think those are separate things. It, it seems like schools have have a pretty substantial need for laptop shaped things. You know, whatever form that takes, it does seem like you know. Obviously, they do sell a lot of iPads in education, but that seems like it's almost a separate thing. Like, it, I think the the laptop form factor. Uh, is has proven to be more popular in recent years than than tablets in schools, and in that form factor, I mean that's I think that's one of the biggest reasons why the MacBook Air still exists. You know, if you look at uh, at Apple's average selling price of the Mac, it's basically the MacBook Air, like by a long shot. It's it, it seems very obvious that they sell like cratefuls of MacBook Airs, like <laughs> they just sell a ridiculous number of them. Um, but that that really is like I think most markets who are buying Chromebooks as an alternative, it's an alternative to MacBook Airs, not to iPads most of the time. I'm probably at the non education discount. Turns out the non education discount for the Mac SE thirty was four thousand dollars, but no hard drive. No hard drive for the four thousand three hundred dollar <laughs> model. <laughs> what did it have? Like a uh, magneto optical or just floppy? Yeah, so, so the non educational discount for the good for the good SE thirty that had an eighty megabyte hard drive and four megs of RAM six thousand five hundred dollars in nineteen eighty nine money. Wow, that's pretty bad. So that's the one. That's one. That's the one with the good amount of RAM and and the big hard drive. Let's see what that one is. Uh, Thirteen thousand dollars. All right, so now we're getting into the modern still, multiplier. Still, <laughs> still, still no keyboard. Still no keyboard. Right. That's next to two hundred bucks. Yeah. So how much was a Civic in in eighty nine or whatever year we're talking about here? I gotta think it was less than or around thirteen thousand or less than that. Yeah, they were they were. That's what very, I'm saying. It seems like it would be ridiculously. It's only ridiculously expensive when you convert for for old people. It's only ridiculously expensive when you convert to today's dollars because back then, like you know, it was the old adage from like whatever that was in a PC magazine. The computer you want is always five thousand dollars. 
and that remained true but that remained true as the decades passed and like you know inflation happened right so it was always five thousand in 1981 the, the computer you wanted was five thousand dollars and in 2010 the computer maybe if you're a computer nerd that you wanted was five thousand dollars but that five thousand dollars was worth a lot a lot more in 1981 than it was in 2010 <laughs> right so it just yeah it was a car <laughs> Yeah, it, it, but anyway, Macs were astronomically expensive. I was always amazed when I saw them in schools. It's because Apple gave deep discounts, and you know, so that forty three hundred dollars for because mine had a hard drive. The forty three hundred dollars for the good SE thirty was an amazing bargain, uh, but nevertheless, uh, a, a tremendous cost. Um, and and I, and my kids' schools these days, I see a surprising amount of desktop Macs still, like their old iMacs, right? And then you see carts full of laptops, which are like ice books, right? Because that's around the era when they bought these things. Um, the reason everything you said about Apple is like when you have a consumer market who cares about these things, that's all true, except that Apple, Apple's image of themselves and the image of themselves that they project to the world still seems to include a lot of stuff having to do with education. Not that they lean on it that much, but I think they like the idea of showing students using these devices. And a lot of even a lot of their advertisements for their modern hardware, granted, they may be pitched at like college students or whatever, but I, I think the company always presents the use of its products in education as something that they are proud of. And yeah, but that that could just be marketing, though. You know, like like I mean, they they're also very proud of people who can draw on an iPad and, and call that a Creative Pro. But that that doesn't mean that they're actually have interest in addressing more of the pro market. But it means that they're not. It, it, what it says to me is they have not given up or are not abandoning that market. They're just not competing that well in it. And maybe that's okay. Maybe you just do have a a reasonable participation and don't really worry that like some cheap vendor is coming in and and, and swamping you in unit sales because you're still a player in the market you're, like you're solidly second or third place among three players even though someone else is selling forex as many things as you are into the market and so maybe that's maybe that's fine with them maybe they feel like they have the high end of the market they're getting all the profits yada 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 but i don't it doesn't seem like they're abandoning it whereas i see fewer and fewer instances where they're showing somebody doing pro work on pro hardware um because, you know, what would they even show them doing? I guess they can show them using Final Cut and... Uh, well, they have them show... They, they show them using Final Cut with the Touch Bar MacBook Pro with these two giant LG monitors behind uh-huh, it. They did, they did <laughs> do that, but it's... I mean, like, even as far, you know, in recent history of the trash can, the, their big demo at WWDC was to have people from Pixar using the trash can to do, you know, heavyweight stuff that basically, like, other computers can't handle this. Because it's just too much. Yeah. It's too much memory. It's too much CPU. That was a long time. Look ago. at how this fancy new computer handles this. That you know, that was that was their demo of like, this is pro hardware for pros, yada yada. And I haven't seen a demo like that since. I haven't seen an ad like that since from Apple. You're right. It's been more about like, look, this amazing laptop. You can edit 4K video on this laptop. Isn't that great? Um, that's great and all. But if your laptop is never going to leave your desk, like, is that the best choice for your editing bay or whatever? Like a laptop. Maybe maybe it is. Maybe that's Apple's vision of the computer, but it's it's a far cry from look. Let's sling around multi gigabyte textures and paint on these models in real time. Uh, you know, with the Pixar employees doing that demo at WWDC. So, I think my main skepticism here is like I don't think there is any strong correlation anymore between the way Apple presents itself and its products in the marketing events and videos and commercials and what they actually make. Like it, 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 I agree with you that they do present themselves as being, you know, as really being, you know, prioritizing education and, and creative people and things that, uh, that it makes for a great video. It makes for a great commercial. It makes for great statements. And I'm sure that a lot of the executives actually believe that themselves. They sincerely believe that. But I think the actions and the results of the company say otherwise. Uh, they, they really do say that, you know, that they are totally fine pricing themselves out of education uh, to a large degree and ignoring actual pro demands when they don't line up with what Apple wants to do for the consumer market. Yeah, it's funny you bring up the uh, trash can Mac because just today one appeared uh, at my desk, not for me to use, but just to, sh- to share. And, and it turned out we had just bought it just in the last week or two because oh, we have God. a we have a guy on staff who's a, a video editor and apparently the dual gpus were enough to sway the it folks to get the trash can rather than just an imac 5k did, did they do any uh, research on when, it? when the new iphone comes out be sh- be sure to show him your your geekbench score on your new iphone 8 is is higher in single core than that <laughs> mac pro i know I know I wasn't involved in any of this. You know, I, it just showed up all of a sudden. But I thought you two would be amused that oh, I, we that's... bought we bought a trash can within the last week or two. That's so sad. 
Sorry. Oh, I can't. I can't take it anymore. Just please, Apple, please fix this. I mean, the last <laughs> thing that I want in the entire freaking world is a new Mac Pro because I, I I might as well just retire from the show for like a month. No, because, because that's the thing. It's going to be nonstop. If they keep not making one, we're going to keep talking about it. If they release a new one, then we'll talk about it for like two weeks, and then you won't hear about it for like a year and a half. Until we start worrying that they're never going to make another one again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which will be about four weeks. But <laughs> no, what I was going to say was uh, I, d- I do not want to talk about it for another you know four weeks if they do finally announce one. Or God forbid they announce one that is called a Mac Pro but is in reality just a iMac 5K++. The last thing I want is for that to happen. So I have to hear you two you know, go on and on and about it forever. But even I... I'm at the point that I'm like, come on, Apple. Really? <laughs> really? This is still a thing? Come on. You're better than this. Thanks to our three sponsors this week, Away, Squarespace, and Pingdom. And we will see you next week. Now the show is over. They didn't even mean to begin. Because it was accidental. accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental. John didn't do Search Marco and Casey wouldn't let him Cause it was accidental, accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental And you can find the show notes at atp.fm And if you're into Twitter You can follow them At C-A-S-E-Y-L I-S-S So that's Casey Liss M-A-R-C-O A-R-M E-N-T Marco Armin S-I-R-A-C U-S-A Syracuse It's accidental You know, I was th- speaking of another yardstick to seeing how into education Apple is. Not that I'm saying this is the best idea in the world, but a thing they used to do is they used to make special computers just for education. The uh, eBack. They, they were spec'd, they were designed and spec'd and priced differently. Sometimes regular people couldn't even buy them. Sometimes regular people wouldn't want to buy them, <laughs> you know. But they, as a means of competing in what has always been a very price-sensitive market, they were like, we, we need to be able to sell into education None of our existing computers, eventually they learned, like none of their existing computers, especially back in the day when every computer that Apple made was better than better and more expensive than all the other ones. They made special versions of computers and special entire computers just for education, su- to suit education's needs, whatever those may be. Uh, that showed, I think, a more serious dedication to the education market. Again, whether that was the best idea to make these special models but, or they should have just changed their other models so they were suitable for education or whatever, that's farther than today's apple seems willing to go um and on the flip side i think i don't know if this is in this new york times article but i've seen it bounced around maybe gruber talked about it that apple is doing much better in it recently mostly because i think the the cold war against max in and corporate environments has thawed over the past i would say decade or so it used to be like you're not even allowed to bring your macintosh from home and connect it to my network because i'm the evil corporate it guy and the whole world's gonna end if you do that right uh, to today, where I think most people joining a company have some expectation that there's a chance that they will either get to choose between a Mac and a Windows PC, or just everybody's using Macs depending on the company. Uh, I mean, look at IBM. They've they got thousands of them, right? Who, who would have thunk it, right? Uh, and the Macs integrate better into enterprise environments. That's because of efforts Apple has made. Both iOS devices and Macs integrate better into enterprise environments because Apple has changed their software in ways that enterprise people wanted to make it more remotely manageable, to have it be compatible with various protocols. It's been slow and it hasn't been that dramatic, but the series of things that they've done have made Macs way more viable in enterprise than they used to be. Despite the fact that they're still pretty much enterprise unfriendly in terms of like how Dell will service and replace your things versus how Apple will do it and stuff like that. Like, they still have a long way to go. And it's interesting that they're sort of the same kind of, I'm not going to say half-hearted, but the same kind of Apple-style approach where we'll make some changes in your behalf, but we're not going to compromise our core beliefs about what a computer should be and how our business should run and so on and so forth, has yielded dividends in enterprise, probably because there is no equivalent to Google coming from nowhere and taking over the enterprise. They're basically just slowly trading market share with microsoft and other windows uh p 
PC type things. Whereas in education, they've been doing things as well to try to make their iOS devices and Macs better for education over the years. But their their pace of innovation there has been swamped by Google coming out with a product that is cheap, easy to manage, people like to use it, removes a lot of pain points that people have been experiencing because the the Chromebook, as we discussed before, is not just like a slightly better or cheaper laptop. It's not a netbook, right? They the advantage they have is that it's a different computing paradigm with the, you know, things on the web, right? And that whole that that whole thing of I've heard them refer to as dumb terminals, but I think that's a that's a pejorative. They're they're not dumb and they're not terminals. It is merely a computer using local hardware to run applications and then using the network for state preservation. And it's a great solution and it's easier for people to manage than installing software and all that other stuff. And that's that I think is why they're winning. Uh, not just because of price, because they could surely get trash, you know, Windows PCs for something close to that price. But a crappy Windows PC is not as easy to manage as a fleet of Chromebooks. All right. So I, I, I think, you know, there is no equivalent to that in enterprise. There is no competitor in enterprise that is making things 10 times easier, let's say, for enterprise IT uh, than Apple or Microsoft or Dell or whatever, whereas there was an education. So I rather than framing this as a failing of Apple, I think it's more fair to frame it as a success for Google. Let's give Google credit for finding one environment into which it can sell its hardware that apparently loves it. <laughs> because it's not the consumer realm. They just they didn't they just cancel the the Chromebook Pixels. They're not making them anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Consumers not so much, but schools schools love it. And you know, kudos to Google. Uh, Apple could have done better, yes, but and so could have Microsoft, but. Bottom line is Google made a product that education loves. John, how much did you say your 1989 Mac was? Eight grand? In today's money? No, no, no. In that money. It was $4,300 plus the keyboard. So you would need another half of a Mac to get a three-door Honda Civic hatchback four-speed, which was $6,385. Almost, John. Almost. 